conversation with the candidate continues. Thank you for clicking on our extended digital conversation with the candidate with former Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper. We're joined again by our live studio audience of Town Hall, regular New Hampshire voters here, and we're going to have our next question coming from Kathleen Hoey. Hello, Governor. Hi, how Kathleen. are you? Um, I wanted to ask you as president, how would you address the high cost of prescription drugs so that people can get the treatment they need rather than sacrificing their basic needs? Kathleen, that is the, one of the questions of the hour, and it's I spent the last couple of days going around New Hampshire. I heard that at every single place I went, the high cost of health care, the high cost of prescription drugs. Uh, I, for the life of me, and I've spent a, time, a lot of time trying to figure it out, I don't understand why, if you're going to buy insulin in Canada, it is one twentieth the cost of buying insulin in this country, and why we're giving preferential treatment to uh, you know, our, our economic neighbors, next door uh, when we're facing such, you know, spiral. People, I mean, I feel first as a, as a to, on any discussion where you're talking about pharmaceuticals or health care, we as a country have to get to that point where we say basic health care is a right, not a privilege, right? And once we accept that, then we can begin the debate of how do we get to, is it, is it Medicare for all? I'm not sure we could do that immediately just because as, as unhappy as many people are with their insurance, their health care insurance, many other people are happy. And you can't just, I don't think it's a good idea when government rips things away from people that are, where they're happy with it. Uh, but we've got to figure out some way to control, find cost controls. One way is transparency. Every hospital, every clinic, if, you're, if your child or your grandchild is, is getting their tonsils out, you should be able to see on your phone what the cost and copay is going to be for you if you go to this clinic or that hospital. And there should be some measure of quality. You should know that you're getting a B plus or an A minus quality, you know, very high level of quality. I mean, that transparency, I think, would allow consumers to make decisions and push the cost curve down. In pharmaceuticals, you know, we have done two things. One is that the, the, the drug companies have had to invest so much money that they need to, to charge sometimes ridiculously high prices for pharmaceuticals. Now, sometimes they're providing a, a, a cure or, or a solution for someone who had no solution before. Uh, and in many cases, that saves society a huge amount of money of taking care of that person who would be in, in miserable circumstances. I mean, that, that works. But in other cases, they're just ramping up the cost for their own profit. And again, that's where transparency is. We should see what, how much money are they investing in research. And as Americans, we should recognize that we've got to unite together with with, with the good drug companies, right, which there are. We have issues in Alzheimer's and dementia. I'm going to guess almost everywhere I go, I ask whether someone, a family member or a close friend, has had Alzheimer's and dementia. Almost everyone says yes. And yet, <coughs> the, the prescription drugs that we're providing for Alzheimer's are the same that we used 10 years ago. And, and there's no, to my knowledge, no drug company that's close to, to a more effective drug. Most of them aren't even putting serious money towards research. We have to change that. By 2050, they're saying that we will be spending $1.2 trillion a year just on various forms of dementia. And, and that's in, in 2018 dollars. Uh, I mean, where's that money going to come from? We have to figure out, as a country, to put more money to, to scientific research, medical research, that is what they call pure research, really looking at, at, the, at, the, at the fundamental parts of biological science, but then also provide incentives so that, that, that large drug, co drug companies who right now are saying, well, Alzheimer's doesn't look beneficial. We're not going to make a profit on it. We have to figure out how to put enough money on, on the table so that they do provide and find a cure for it, because otherwise it's just going to suck money out of our entire community. So A, make sure that we get a fair deal that we can negotiate for pharmaceuticals like, anybody, like these other countries do. Uh, and, the, and B, make sure the future drugs aren't as expensive. The, the other thing we could do, for, for large, uh, broad, expanse uh, pharmaceuticals and drugs, we now, uh, it, in some cases, will require up to 250,000 people be part of that test population before it's approved by the FDA. Well, with big data, a lot of people think that we could do that same amount of research with 10,000 people, which would be dramatically less expensive. And if it gets us that same information, yeah, again, we should demand that the, that, that that, that is resolved, that, 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 that savings to the drug companies results in lower prices.
interesting. Thank you no, so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Kathleen. And there's a good follow-up coming from social media and Jim Wilkie. He asks, what is your plan to provide universal health care coverage? So Colorado, uh, we got to almost universal coverage. We've got just, just short of 95% coverage. We expanded Medicaid. We have, I think, the most innovative uh, and, and really one of the most successful health care exchanges in the country. But we didn't get to 100%. And I think we do need a public option. Now, if we do that public option, let's say it's Social Security. I mean, <laughs> uh, that's, that's where I'm really going to get myself in trouble. Um, <laughs> It, let, let's say that it is Medicare, right, or Medicare, uh, you know, one of the other forms of, of Medicare. How do we make sure that, uh, that people know how to get there and that it scales rapidly enough so that they're real co cost savings? So you have Medicare, you have Medicare Advantage. There's are certain other twists there. What we want to get to is the point where, is get to the point where that's, that, that, uh, that public option allows people a choice. So if their health care is too expensive or doesn't provide enough coverage, they can get to, to Medicare. Uh, and, and if more people go to Medicare, then we can actually get, I mean, someday we can get to Medicare for all. People have to remember, I think, that we're you know, over 150 million people right now have insurance with, their, with a private insurance company, and many of them are unhappy with that insurance. And, and the, the inflation that happens seems like every year is you know, six, eight, ten percent. But we also have to remember that many people are happy with it. And so I don't think we can go immediately. I, uh, I have tremendous respect for Senator Sanders and all the work he's done to provide clarity to some of these ma you know, major issues facing uh, this country. But I don't, in this particular case, I don't agree with his solution. In this same vein, uh, as governor in Colorado, uh, on the issue of health care and specifically mental health, what have you done about mental health? Uh, in, obviously, one of the ter terrible problems we have in the United States with mass shootings, mental health seems to be a big issue, and you saw one of the worst uh, there in, in uh, Colorado yourself. So mental health as it relates to our gun problem. In this so when we, when we had the shooting in the Aurora movie theater uh, in 2012, and one of the most sobering things in my life was going to that, that, that the, the, the control, the, the command, the portable control center, the mobile co uh, command center. And I saw the video. I was there with the, the mayor of Aurora and the, the chief of police. And we saw the video of the crime scene right when it came out. And it was just sobering beyond I can express with words. We, first, we said, all right, we're going to have a period of mourning for the... For the so for the families of the victims and for the victims themselves that survived to, 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 to grieve. But then we came out and the first thing we did was we said we would, set, we would uh, provide $30 million a year for mental health. Uh, the next thing we did was go toward universal background checks. And even after that shooting, we could not get the National Rifle Association to go along. Every single Republican business leader I knew thought universal background checks were the best. And I got in this fight with my son, Teddy. <laughs> I came home and made the mistake of complaining to him. He was in fifth grade. He goes, Dad, what's so hard that you do at work all day? Make decisions? I said, well, Teddy. I said, he goes, Dad, get the facts, make a decision, check next. I go, well, Teddy, it's not that easy. Dad, get the facts, make a decision, check next. Every day I've got to go to school and learn something completely new each day that I didn't know existed today, but the day before. And if I don't get it perfectly, uh, the next day is misery because everything's based on... You know, after five minutes, I said, Teddy, you're right. Fifth grade is harder than being governor. <laughs> but then I went and got, I went and got the facts on, on uh, universal background checks just in Colorado. Because we were getting to, like almost all states, we were getting to about half the gun purchases. We wanted to get to universal coverage, uh, have everyone get a, uh, a, a, a background check. And the, the, my Republican friend said, crooks aren't stupid. They're not going to get a background check. Why should the rest of us pay 10 bucks and wait around? Here's what happened in Colorado, population 5 million people, 5.5 million people, in 2012, getting to half the gun purchases. 38 people convicted of homicide tried to buy a gun, and we stopped them. 133 people convicted of sexual assault, uh, I mean, 620 burglars, 1,300 people convicted of felony assault, that's where someone usually goes to the hospital, tried to buy a gun, and, and, and we stopped them. Uh, there were 420 people who had judicial restraining orders not to see their ex-spouse or their ex-boss. They tried to buy a gun. And we stopped them. And just in case you don't think crooks are st aren't stupid, 140 people, when they picked up their new gun, we arrested them for an outstanding warrant for a violent crime. Those statistics, to me, are so powerful. And, and so we're the first purple state.
that got universal background checks passed. Uh, we had two Democratic senators that were recalled. There was a, NRA put a huge amount of money into, into making sure that they got recalled from the state Senate. But we got it done. I think we also have to, the question was also about mental health. And we, even though we're putting all this money into mental health, it is still, we are in a, a national epidemic of mental health. And there's a level of depression and despair that people all over this country are feeling. Uh, that earlier question when we talked about, you know, why are people, why is our unhappiness, our unhappiness coefficients and measurements so significant? A lot of that is mental health issues. And we have to, we have to address them. You know, suicides continue to go up. From, look at in New Hampshire, from 1999 to 2016, your rate of suicides went up 48%. That's the highest in the nation. And that is, and it's not just here. You look at, uh, uh, in the Mountain West, we have very high suicide rates. Uh, on, on the other hand, but connected, look at the level of opioid uh, addiction that we're seeing, and that translates sometimes into heroin addiction. These are all evidence of people, you know, not being able to, to deal with the system in which, in which they find themselves. And the only way we're gonna work our way out of this is as a country by coming together, not fighting about it and creating division, you win, I lose, but we've got to come together as a country and really deal with this. Okay, social media question now from John Foote, who's asking the inverse of a question that's sometimes put to uh, people running for office. He asks, can you explain backing abortion while at the same time being against the death penalty? Can I explain backing abortion while being the same against the death penalty? So I look at abortion as one of the most difficult issues facing the country because people have such deeply held uh, feelings about it. Uh, and in the end, I, I became good friends. I'm an Episcopalian, but I became good friends with our previous Archbishop uh, in, of the Catholic Church. And in the end, we agreed that we were, we were going to disagree on this, but we, we both felt that we, should, we would do everything we could to make sure there were less abortions. And I feel, in the end, I think that women have to have the, the, the right to control their own health, their own health care. And one of the things we did in Colorado was we provided what they call LARC, long-acting reversible contraception, so things like Norplants, uh, to allow women from age 15 to 25, regardless of their financial circumstances, to decide when they wanted to have families, right? That they had control of their own health care. And in that process, we reduced teenage pregnancy and teenage abortion by more than 60%. And I think that's part of where we get to. Uh, I mean, abortion is such a difficult uh, issue. Uh, I think we've got we've to get to a point where, where we all agree that we're going to do everything we can to make sure we have less and less and less situations of unwanted, unintended pregnancies. Now, in terms of the death penalty, uh, I was always for it my whole life until you actually look at the facts. And the facts are, that it costs a fortune, somewhere between, depending on what state you're in, 10 and $20 million once you pay for all the appeals. It's not a deterrent. States that got rid of the death penalty 50 years ago have no increase in homicides or mass murders. Uh, it drags the family members of victims through the worst period of their life again and again for every appeal. And perhaps most importantly, it is, it is, it is the, the, the ultimate penalty and again and again, we found we've made mistakes. Eyewitnesses are wrong. DNA proves someone innocent. And, and even more than that, it depends on where that crime is committed. And, and it, most data suggests whether the, the, the guilty party is, is a minority, on whether they get tried as a, for, on, as a death penalty case. Sometimes the same, cri the same crime in two neighboring jurisdictions, almost identical crimes, one will get tried as a death penalty, and one will be tr tried as life in prison without parole. Uh, and, you know, as you get those facts, it's hard not, at least for me, it's hard for me not to come out against the death penalty. Next question comes from Aaron Motto of Derry. Welcome to New Hampshire. This country is very politically polarized, trading right and wrong for left and right. What would you do to change this? Well, that's a great question, and thank you so much. The, this notion of, of the, the polarization, I, I mean, I'm running for president, because I think we are facing a crisis, a, a, a national crisis of division. And I don't think, you know, I grew up during the civil rights protests and the protests against the Vietnam War in the 1960s. I think we're more divided now than we were then. I think you have to go back to the Civil War to see 
this country as divided as it is today. And I really feel that part of what I've done, and, and you know, I never ran for student council or anything before I ran for mayor of Denver in 2003, but I ran for mayor because I'd worked to bring mayors to, or worked to bring restaurant owners together when I first opened my restaurant in 1988. When I became mayor, I, I brought together all the mayors in the region that used to hate each other, and, and there were two thirds of them Republicans. We created, we, we passed together, all 34 mayors unanimously supported a tax increase to create a, a, a transit system that really works. Uh, as governor, we got the environmental community to work with the oil and gas industry to, to pass methane regulations, that, the equivalent of taking 320,000 cars a year off the road, as I said. I mean, those are records of bringing people together uh, and getting progressive achievement. And I think that's, I mean, that's why I'm running, is I feel like I can bring people together and, and get results. I'm a, you know, there were a lot of dreamers in Washington. I'm a dreamer too, but I'm also a doer. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, long term, I, I know I can beat Donald Trump. But I also think I can bring us together on the other side and really create positive, progressive change. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aaron. Next question comes from Ann Ackerman. Hi there. My question is, what specific criteria would you use in uh, nominating uh, members for a cabinet and for uh, judicial appointments? Thank you. Uh, that, that is... An excellent question. That's the first time I've gotten that specific question, although I've been thinking it in my head. So I think I'm, <clears throat> I, I am prepared in that sense that when I got elected mayor, I didn't care whether someone was a Republican or a Democrat. I ran for mayor. I was going to try, you know, try and lift up the whole metropolitan area, but I was also going to try and, and fight back against what I call the fundamental nonsense of government. And that's where the people that help you get elected, you appoint them to run these big, complex agencies of city government or state government or federal government if you're running for president. And I wanted to, the best managers and leaders, people that knew how to mobilize and incentivize and hold accountable a large workforce. Uh, and we hired Republicans, Democrats. We also focused on div diversity. And that when I first became mayor, we had, I don't know, almost 50% people of color. Uh, I think it was almost 60% women. We had the most diverse group of people, and I got mayor, elected mayor in, in 2003. Uh, two and a half years later, uh, uh, Time Magazine ranked me as one of the top five big city mayors in America. That wasn't about me. I barely knew where the bathrooms were. It had been two and a half years. It was a reflection that I had in this diversity and, and the talent that we assembled, this amazing group of people. So experience is a huge part of this. Uh, obviously, integrity. I think is, is, is critically important, right? You cannot build an, a, a team and a, accomplish great goals without integrity. And I would say the same, you can't have a great judge without integrity. You've got to have intellect, right? People have to be able to un understand complex issues and figure out in, in, when you've got a difficult decision to make, how do, what is the most important and, and the crucial elements in that, in that problem so that you make the right decision? Uh, so I think integrity, uh, intellect, and you know, ultimately a, a, a vision for, you know, for what a positive, progressive future looks like, right? That we, this, this country's always got to keep moving forward and making progress. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Thank you, Ann. Next question comes from Trish Joy of Gosstown. Hi. Good morning, Governor. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm a senior on Social Security, and <clears throat> I'm single, and I need to work two jobs. Um, and I'm wondering how you would make sure social, social Security stays solvent as we're going to run out of money, I think, by the year 2034. So that means I'll be working forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hear you. And <laughs> at a time when, again, 75 to 80 percent of the families in this country don't, they, they're having a hard time balancing their household budgets at the end of every month. We are at a, at, at a crossroads where we've got to make some really important decisions. And certainly Social Security should be inviolate, right? By that I mean you, no one should be able to mess with it. And part of the, you know, when there are withholding taxes, when people are, uh, money is taken out of their payroll to pay for Social Security, it stops at a certain level at about uh, whatever it is, 134000 I mm -hmm. think. I'd have to go check. Yes. Why does it stop at 134,000? You know, I think 
that if we let that go on up, so the people that make five million dollars are still paying that that sliver for percent. Yeah, exactly. That 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 small amount of their paycheck. And when you're making that kind of money, why would you why would you fight? I'm sure they will fight me on it. Mm -hmm. But if 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 we would make that one change, it would take it would take about eighty or eighty five percent of the of the problems with social balancing social security. It would eliminate them. So I'd start there, right? And then I would also focus on how do we make sure that there the other parts that have been eroding the purchasing power of of social security over the years, such as the cost of housing. As the cost of housing goes up, uh, again, for many, for many individuals, uh, it eats up a larger part of that very limited amount of money. The, the same thing in terms of the cost of health care, right? Even, even Medicare, you still have to pay into Medicare. Mm -hmm. How do we protect that so it's not taking a little bit of a bigger chunk? Because you know very well that you know, Social Security is not lavish, right? <laughs> You're working two jobs. I'm working two jobs. I mean, it's... it's, it's it, it, we should protect Social Security, and I give you my word, if I'm elected, I will not allow any dilution uh, to Social Security. I, I will veto any kind of legislation that, that reduces Social Security, and I would focus on making sure that at every level we've tried to restore and make, uh, make permanent a, a solvency, that we don't run out of money. Okay. Thank you. No, you bet. Thank you, Trish. Following on that, Governor... Uh, National debt, $22 trillion. If you're going to fix Social Security, it's going to cost money. What about the debt? The debt drives me nuts. <coughs> and I think the bottom line is, and, and I'm going to go off a little bit, and I'll, I'll restrain myself, take a deep breath. I mean, we passed a tax cut uh, in the recent past, and that tax cut, rough justice, was $1.5 trillion dollars. And it benefited a very small number of people. And it's going to be paid long term by a very large number of people, which is to say our children and grandchildren to a large extent. Here's an interesting thing that I haven't seen reported, but I think it's pretty accurate. That $1.5 trillion, which essentially went into our national debt, right? Go look at, at, at the, we're, we're not seeing the gigantic extra revenues, our, 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 our deficits going up, up, up. That $1.5 trillion goes into our national debt. Half of that tax break was the corporate America, right? And I don't deny that, they, that, that our tax rates have to be competitive. We didn't have to make it the lowest tax rate in the whole country. And if you, if you take a moment and think about it, uh, half of it, so that's about $750 billion, goes to corporate America. 30% of, of the shares in our publicly traded stocks are owned by foreigners and foreign country, foreign uh, corporations and foreign governments. So we basically gave 30% of the 750 billion. You know, now you're getting close to to 250 billion dollars we gave as a gift, a gift to people that don't even live here. Uh, obviously, I would balance the budget. And this notion that I mean, every governor, I got to balance the budget every single year. And even in their when they're bad years. You figure out how to do it. It's no fun. People get angry. It's life. Every one of us has to balance our budgets. The, the federal government, the notion that they can continue to print money, and now some people are saying, well, long term, it doesn't really matter. Don't let them kid you. It will come back and bite us. When, if insurance rates start going up, uh, insurance rates, interest rates start going up. Insurance rates already have gone up. <laughs> but if interest rates uh, start going up, that, 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 cost, the amount of money that's going to pull out of our spending capability for the federal government, to, it, it, it's just going to pull more money out and make it harder to balance a budget than it is today, which obviously is, 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 is not easy. So I will balance the budget, and then I will focus on trying to build the economy in a way that really does let us work our way out of this incredible, that's, I mean, that's the only real way. I can't imagine that we're going to be able to uh, cut the, 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 the national budget in such a way that we address the, the overall, um, uh, you know, there's this, this huge gap uh, in, a, in a positive way. But I think we can, if we balance the budget, then as we grow our economy, we will slowly but surely have the, the, the national debt be a smaller and smaller and a smaller percentage of our GDP. If you're going to balance the budget, don't you have to cut something somewhere, though? It seems like we only balance that budget yeah, in times of plenty. So what gets cut? Oh, my gosh. The well, first thing... No one has really come in in, in, in in years and years and years and looked at how do we make the federal government more effective. 
And it's not just, you know, sometimes when you just randomly fire people or force them to leave and you don't replace them, you actually make things more expensive and worse. Uh, when I was mayor of Denver, uh, I came in, it's, it's, you know, it's funny, my mother, as I said, my mother was widowed twice uh, before she was 40, but my mother also grew up in the Depression. And so she sold all her own clothes, uh, she never bought a dress, she would wash tinfoil and tape it to the refrigerator door to, to make sure she could reuse it, I'm not making this up. But that's, that approach to, um, to frugality is a big, is a place to start. And it's funny, all my grandparents were Republicans, all my aunts and uncles were Republicans, but my mother felt government should be smaller, but government had to work. And she raised four Democrats. Uh, I look at the, at, at, you know, where are you gonna uh, make cuts? Part of it's efficiency. So when I was mayor of Denver, uh, from when I began to when I left, we had 7% fewer employees when I left than when we began, and yet we were doing probably half again, providing half again more services. Uh, that's the first place you, you, you find cuts. And then you have to look at, at, at savings in, I mean, right now we're, we're spending 19% of our GDP for healthcare. I, I mean, all, you take the average of Europe and they're at about 10%. That's almost half of what we're spending and they have better outcomes. You can't tell me that if we actually got people to come together and we got the hospital association and the doctors and the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies all to work together and just say, you're all gonna have to take a little bit of a hit, but we cannot continue spending at this level and we can't continue this inflation that we wouldn't begin to, to uh, bring that back. And then part of it is, even as we're trying to balance the budget uh, spending, we're gonna have to address things that have been you know, uh, off the list. In terms of our military, do we need quite so many bases overseas as we have today? Uh, and we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of, of, of bases over, overseas. I think maybe we should be investing more money in things like cybersecurity that I think are more, provide a greater danger to America right now. And that we begin looking at how do we get more efficient use out of our, you know, uh, our international relationships. Uh, you know, if I was president, I could tell you the two things I wouldn't do. I wouldn't ignore the advice of the most talented and experienced military officers and intelligence officers in the world. I, wouldn't ignore, I would not ignore their advice. And I also would make sure that we didn't alienate our allies. Uh, I understand trying to browbeat allies into paying more. I'm not sure that's the best way to get there. I think getting everyone to work together could actually save us money long term in how we allocate our dollars. We've got about two minutes left here. And this story uh, of your upbringing, uh, I'd like you to touch on that a little bit more. A formative experience, obviously, having uh, a single mother uh, and losing your father at age eight. How did that shape you, do you think, as a leader, watching her and then also having lost your father at such a young age? Well, my mother, my mother told us uh, again and again, she said, you can't control what life throws at you, uh, but you can control how you respond. Does it make you stronger or weaker? Does it make you better or worse? And she told each of us that we had to you know, figure out what our calling was. It, was it sports? Was it drama club? Was it academics? You know, I was moderately dyslexic, so I was never a good student, so that choice was easier for me. Um, but, you know, I threw myself into sports uh, and just, you know, I'm probably the most competitive person that any of you know. I try to hide it to a certain extent. Uh, but I think that she laid that out. Also, losing your father when you're, uh, when you're very young, uh, most experts agree that you end up having to raise yourself to a certain extent. Uh, you don't get the guidance. My mother had a lot of stuff on her plate. So I never knew what clothes I should be wearing. Or I, I wore these awful geeky glasses when I, I had thick, thick glasses when I was a kid. I mean, you try growing up with thick glasses and a funny last name and acne and, you know, I got bullied. People say, what are you gonna do about Trump? About Trump when you get to debate with, to debate with him? Trust me, I know how to deal with bullies, right? That, that is not a hard thing to, it's not as hard as what people make it out to be. But when you raise yourself, uh, you end up, sometimes it takes you a while to learn what, to, to gain confidence. And I've, of all the people running for president, all the people being talked about running for president, I'm gonna guess I'm the only one who never ran for student council, let alone class president. I, I didn't have the confidence. And only when I opened that restaurant and I built a team and saw that we could change a whole community and then I became mayor and had put a bigger, better team together, that's when I really began to realize, you know, I am a leader. I mean, it, was, it came kind of as a shock. Uh, and I think sometimes that, that approach to leadership especially right now at this moment in America, might be just what we need. Governor John Hickenlooper, we thank you so much for your time.
Thank you so much to our audience here today and for all of you who watched through the digital conversation. We very much appreciate it. Next week, Congressman Tim Ryan. But again, thank you for watching and thank you to Governor John Dickenlooper. Go ahead and meet the audience. Thank you. I appreciate your time.